afternoon. So Senator Abler is coming to do, uh, we're going to do, we'll start off with Senate file 902 and, and then 903 and we'll go in that order. Um, welcome to our Wednesday, February 13th, 2023 Senate Human Services Committee. Um, I will have to let you know, Senator Abler, that it, apparently there was a hundred people that were viewing our last hearing online. So All right. that is correct. Uh, um, not that I would compare to last year, but um, we're doing 902. Senate file 902, uh, home care services, medical assistant reimbursement rates increase. Senator Abler and Kathy Messerly, Cameo Zender is here, and Jason Bennett. So, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of bills that we hear in this committee, and some are kind of nice, and some are important, some are essential and critical. Uh, if we do not keep the uh, home care industry working and functional, it will be very, very bad. Um, this committee has been dedicated trying to help upon that. Uh, part of my goal in my life has been to encourage the governor to be interested uh, on this topic as well, and so I pray every day that he notices. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I, I have uh, testifiers who are much more eloquent than me, and I would like to request that they be allowed to speak. Thank you, Ms. Senator Abler. Ms. Messerly, welcome to, for the record, state your name and... Thank Not that you. you live in a certain Senate district that, you know, is close here, but, you know, go ahead. Nice to see you, by the way. Good to see you as well. Chair Huffman and members of the committee, my name is Kathy Messerly, and I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Home Care Association. Our members provide hands-on care to approximately 40,000 older Minnesotans and individuals with disabilities and complex health conditions in their homes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of Senate File 902, a bill aimed at increasing access to more Minnesotans to critical home care services. More and more home care agencies are limiting services or, worse yet, closing their doors due to workforce challenges. This has led to more individuals turning to intensive, expensive, and currently overly stressed hospitals and long-term care settings. It's a challenging cycle as hospitals are unable to safely discharge patients back to their home due to lack of available home care. The staff who provide skilled nursing and related services that support Minnesotans to remain living in their own homes in the most cost-effective setting are underpaid and undervalued. With the, demographic, with the demographic trend of fewer people in the workforce, we must do all we can to offer strong wages and benefits to those individuals who do step forward to provide critical home care services. Because legislatively set reimbursement rates heavily dictate the wages and benefits that are offered to staff providing medical assistance home care services, the legislature must act to allocate the investments required to implement these needed increases. This is all the more urgent with current legislative consideration of FMLA and sick and safe time. Senate file 902 calls for an increase for the medical assistance reimbursement rates for nursing, therapies, and home health aides to help address home care's current low wages. This increased reimbursement will help address the current lack of access to home care services. Our state can and must do better. This bill is a step in that direction. Thank you for your consideration of this critical need and I'm happy to take questions. Members, any questions for Ms. Messerly? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Abler. Ironically, um, I was discussing this uh, situation with uh, a home care provider whose name I will not disclose. Who, they say, oh, we don't take medical assistance. Uh, they just can't afford it. And so if you have money, then you're good to go. If you happen to have a disability or be you know, substantially uh, challenged with your economics, you don't. That's what this bill talks about. So just to make you feel better, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have another testifier who I think will be impressive, too. Thank you, Senator Abler, and also members. Just before we go to Ms. Zender, there is a, a letter from the ARC Minnesota uh, regarding both Senate Files 902 and 903, which are going to be the first two in front of us. So, Ms. Cameo Zender, welcome. Thank you, Chair Hoffman and members of the committee. My name is Cameo Zender, and I'm the Chief Administrative Officer with Pediatric Home Service. We provide hospital-level care to medically fragile children 
including home care nursing and high-tech medical equipment services. Home care services are critical for children and adults with disabilities. I am speaking today as a pediatric provider, but the challenges are felt equally across agencies and patients, regardless of age. The workforce sh shortage is certainly a theme this legislative session, and all aspects are worthy of attention and innovation. Today, I ask that we shine a brighter light on the extraordinary impact on our most fra fragile populations and the remarkable nurses that care for them. These nurses are practicing at an ICU level, whether in the hospital or in the home. They care for patients on life support equipment and with rare diseases. The crux of the issue is that the nurses who choose to practice in the home earn only 50 to 65% of the wage that they can earn in the hospital, providing the same level of care. This is making it increasingly difficult for agencies to recruit and retain nurses. This translates to extended hospitalizations at a time when hospitals are already overwhelmed. Children are remaining in the hospital, medically ready for discharge, and waiting for nursing for 90 extra days on average. This is a 40-day increase from a study that was published in 2016. This is devastating for families who have just been waiting to bring their babies home. And from a cost perspective, under the most conservative estimate, we are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in excess for each delayed discharge. We can do better for everyone. Once home, we are still failing our patients and their families but because we cannot provide consistent, adequate staffing. For many years, PHS tracked a 92 to 95% fill rate of the number of hours that were ordered for nursing care for our patients. Today, we are hovering at 70%, with some family schedules filled only to 35%. Families are picking up the burden, and they are desperately seeking our help. We know there is much work ahead to fully solve the workforce crisis, and we are all in. However, we must close the hospital versus home pay gap for any additional approaches to possibly take flight. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I ask for your support. Thank you, Ms. Sender. Anybody who's not seen the work that you do at Pediatric Home Services, I would um, recommend that folks go pay you a visit. Always uh, welcome. Uh, thank you. Senator Abler. Um, well, thank you, there's another testifier, and I just want to point out that this committee has uh, under bipartisan leadership has paid great attention to this matter. Cool. And, you know, it's, it's the thing is, um, the, you know, pay now or pay later, you know, with your maintenance, this is actually backwards. We're paying a ton now, and we could pay less if we just actually would keep this industry afloat. This is the future of keeping people out of hospitals, out of nursing homes, out of facilities. So the testifier, I think, Mr. Chair, you'll find to be quite interesting. Thank you. With that, Senator Abler, uh, Jason Bennett, you're online and the internets. Welcome to uh, the, the committee. Thank you, Chair Hoffman and committee members for the opportunity to speak with you again on uh, the importance of Senate File 902. Uh, my name is Jason Bennett and I'm before you again as the father of a severely disabled child. Uh, I live in North Mankato with my fiance and our family of four children who range in age from 11 to 22. I work as a detective for a police department and my fiance works in state government. I have a bachelor's degree in law enforcement and a master's in public administration. I also serve on the board of Peace Officer Standards and Training appointed by Governor Walls in 2019. Just in short, we're a family of public servants. Uh, our daughter Ashlyn just turned 18 years old last month and is a junior at Mankato East High School. In 2008, she was diagnosed with Rett syndrome, which is caused by a genetic mutation on the X chromosome. She cannot walk or talk, effectively communicate with others or interact with her environment. She is completely dependent on others for everything and to list all of her cares would take much longer than the time I have available. In short, she requires a hospital level of care, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just to remain at home. I appeared before you just over a month ago to tell you how Senate File 7 could provide help to us and families like ours all over Minnesota. And today I'm here to say the same thing about Senate File 902. This is a bill that is laser focused on what I believe is at the absolute heart of the crisis we are in, which is inadequate caregiver pay. Since I appeared before you, it's been 35 days, about 840 hours. Uh, during that time, Ashlyn has still needed 24 hour seven nursing coverage. 
And in that time, we've had a nurse for 420 hours or 50% of the time. It's an average of 84 hours per week that there was no nurse to care for her. And it's the equivalent of two full-time nurses that we don't have. And in that case, and this isn't an anomaly, this is, this is our normal. This leaves my fiance and I to try to fill in as a nurse, which we're not. And we're essentially working two jobs. And when there's no nurse, we don't have a choice. There's, there's nothing that can take priority over her care. But we have to forego vacations, going out on dates, sleep, and even frequently our jobs just to cover the shifts. And we've even had discussions about whether one of us should leave our jobs to provide the care that Ashlyn needs. Ashlyn receives in-home nursing care from Pediatric Home Service, and they're an amazing company. And from, from a, a standpoint of a family, and from what I've heard from the nurses, they're, they're an amazing company to work for. But because of the low payment rates, they can't pay the nurses wages that are competitive. Over the years, we've lost so many nurses to better paying hospital jobs and very few stay to work in home care longer than maybe a couple of years. And, and why would they want to work in home care instead of the hospital? In, in home care, there's so much uncertainty in the environment they'll be working on. They're the only medical staff that's on site. So if something goes wrong, the only backup they might have is, is a family member to come help. If a nurse takes a day off at home care or they call out sick, there's no one to cover. And these aren't concerns in a hospital setting. And, and for all that underlying uncertainty and stress that comes along with being a home care nurse, they make tens of thousands of dollars less than nurses in a hospital. And the bottom line is the pay gap for home care nurses has to be closed for families like ours to even have a shot at getting care for our loved ones. The bill's 55% increase in payment rate makes a significant dent in that gap, but it doesn't close it completely. Without it, even that 55%, it, it, the shortage is only going to get worse. And if it continues, like I said, one or both of us are going to have to leave our jobs uh, just to provide the basic day-to-day -day medical care that Ashley needs to keep her alive. We, we won't be her parents. We'll be her nurses. We won't be able to provide insurance coverage for our family. We have three other children who we won't be able to devote the necessary time and attention to. We have no time as a family, no quality of life to speak up for Ashlyn or, or any of us. All our time, energy, and resources are dedicated to attempting to provide the level of medical care that Ashlyn needs and, and quite frankly is care that we're not qualified to provide. It's gonna to lead to more hospitalizations for her and, and probably very poor health outcomes. It doesn't have to be this way. I, I know that this bill isn't gonna solve all the problems of home care nursing shortage, but it, it's at least a step in the right direction and the, the time to act is now. It can't wait any longer and, and there can be no half measures. Things are only going to get worse. And if we haven't reached it already, a breaking point is, is inevitable. It's a significant step in helping families like ours by paying them a, a home care nurse as a competitive wage uh, that is commensurate with the critical care that they provide. It will help Ashlyn and people like her to be healthy and remain at home and to receive the quality medical care they need and allow families like ours to continue to work in and contribute to our communities. It will let us be parents to our medically fragile children. I'm again, happy to help in any way possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jason. Uh, it, it, you are you are helping by um, telling your lived experience as a parent, and as a parent, I, I hear you. And so, um, thank you for your time once again, Senator Abler. Mr. Chair, I think this is if uh, this is the best committee. We get to see real people living real lives who just want to be. And without this care, some of them will not be. We've already heard stories about that, uh, other Dan and others, and um, it just cannot be. And I think if you don't weep when you watch these hearings, uh, then you're not listening. And the stability of the families and the individuals served in these areas is just of, of paramount human interest. And to Jason and to the people represented by these folks here, it's just a real honor to get to sit here. The next bill is very similar. Yep. Um, so um, we can almost just change gears if you want. But it's, I, I just, I was just talking to a, a lobbyist today who's in this side and I just said, why do I get misty so much? And this committee, I think over the last now seven years, counting this year, has really taken the lead on trying to make a real difference. And I'm happy you're continuing that, Mr. Chair. So with that, I, we can move to the next one if you want. Thank you, Senator. We're going to lay this one over. I, I would assume that Senator Dr. Mann, fiscal note somewhere along the line, we should probably get that as well. Our wonderful friends in the corner. 
could hear that. So uh, with that, members, any questions for anybody? If not, we'll go right to Senate File 903. Senator Abler. Senator, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the privilege of carrying uh, your bill. Um, and it's just convenient that we can talk about this. This has to do with uh, the similar topic and allowing for a care evaluation and some more rates. And my testifier will cover the nuances of all that. But uh, there's a lot of things we do in this, in this government of ours. And some are really essentials where people live and die. Some are important and many important things. And some are just the lower tier. This topic here, whatever we have and what this costs to keep this intact, we must do it. Um, because if we don't, there's not enough nursing homes, not enough group homes, not assisted living beds, not enough hospital beds to take care of these groups, these folks uh, who need this care to actually live, to simply live, never mind thrive. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to my testifier. Ms. Messerly, nice to see you again. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Chair, members of the committee, again, my name is Kathy Messerly, and I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Home Care Association. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 903. As we discussed in the previous bill, our state must continue to take steps to better increase access to home care services for older adults and those living with disabilities and complex health needs. Senate File 903 is a targeted approach aimed at three specific home care services that are the most challenging for providers as they are either under or non-reimbursed. I just want to emphasize that some of the services they're offering are not reimbursed at all. The bill has three parts. First, it establishes a new reimbursement rate for a limited number of care evaluation visits. This change is aimed at implementing a reimbursement closer to the actual cost that providers incur for three specific kinds of home care evaluations. All three visits are required and are more comprehensive than a typical home care visit. It takes two to three times as long as a standard visit, which is what the current reimbursement rate is set at. Service plans are developed, they're revisited, they're adjusted during these evaluations. They include the start of care, a recertification every 60 days, and lastly, a resumption of care, which is when there's an interruption in care, such a hospitalization. Secondly, the bill directs DHS to collaborate with stakeholders to identify medical assistance services for care coordination services. The activities of that, the section of this bill, is aimed at recognizing at least a small amount of care coordination work that is currently being performed without any reimbursement. Examples include reaching out to a pharmacy, a doctor, for additional guidance or orders. The additional reimbursement would only cover time outside of patient visits. And the testifier that follows me will give a few more examples on that. Finally, the bill restructures the reimbursement rate for homemaker services to be more reflective of the current market data. Homemaker services are a critical but often overlooked service that enables people to remain in their home. The current rate for homemaker services does not allow for a livable wage to be paid. Many agencies have discontinued offering homemaker services simply because they cannot hire anyone at that low wage. I ask for your support of Senate File 903 and happy to address questions. Thank you, Ms. Messerly. Any questions for our testifier? Um, I kind of jumped the gun. You know, imagine that, John Hoffman, that, you know, jumping the gun on something. I should have introduced the Senator Abler, the A1 amendment, that, that uh, uh, but then again, shoulda, coulda, now we're gonna go ahead and do that, if that's all right. If Mr. Anybody that would've wants. been my job, since I'm the presenter, so it's, it's, sorry you couldn't find someone better to present your bill. <laughs> I'd like to move the A1 Amendment, Mr. Thank Chair. You. <laughs> Members, uh, Senator Abel moves the A1 Amendment. This is an author's amendment. Puts it in the, the form that we wanted. It, all it those in favor. Effective dates, just so people know. Mr. Thank you, all those in favor. No, did you, Senator, did, do you know what he, did you hear that over there? Senator Fate, scratch that roll call conversation. <laughs> 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 tough, all those in favor say aye. Aye, opposed, same sign. Senator Abler, uh, with that, Susan Morgan from Accra is, she's on the internets. So. What's this internet? Ms. Morgan, welcome to the committee. Um, Thank you so much. I hope you can all hear me okay. We can. Okay. 
Chair Hoffman and committee members, my name is Susan Morgan, and I am the Chief Operating Officer at ACRA and a registered nurse who has worked in healthcare for over 40 years. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 903. As some of you know, ACRA is a nonprofit organization founded 30 years ago to focus on the underserved. Our mission is to improve lives by providing support to clients who may be chronically ill or disabled in all 87 counties in Minnesota. At ACRA, we see every day how the underfunding of various home care services and activities impacts those who are in dire need of these services. This section of the bill proposing an update to the reimbursement rate for homemaker services is very needed. Homemaker service is commonly the first home care service that a client needs. As a body declines, these homemaker tasks become more difficult to manage independently. Unkempt homes with loads of laundry undone, dishes stacked high, attracting all kinds of vermin, was something that I saw regularly when I worked at public health when investigating vulnerable adult cases. We would often refer these individuals for homemaker services. And years ago, the reimbursement rates were adequate to attract and pay staff to provide this type of work. But today, that is no longer the case. In addition, home care agencies have for years absorbed the cost of starting or resuming care for a client in the home. An RN must do an in-depth evaluation visit, which can take up to two hours in the home, as well as another two to three hours of documentation once back in the office. And yet, these evaluations are reimbursed at a regular visit rate. Another task that home care agencies are not reimbursed for is care coordination. This involves advocating for clients in many ways. It might be to track down necessary equipment or medications that a client was not sent home with from the hospital, or making arrangements for them to access Meals on Wheels when better nutrition is needed. This also is an unreimbursed service. I ask for your support of this proposal to help more Minnesotans get access to the supports that they need to remain living in their own homes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Um, any questions, comments? Care coordination services unreimbursed. Did I hear that right, Senator Abler? Coordination. Coordination. 1986. You want me to yell the public law on that one that said coordinate, Mr. comprehensive, Chair, what was the public law you're referencing? 99.457. Thank you. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And I... We're, these are brief. We're um, going to yield the balance of the time to Senator Mayquade for some other topics that are really important. Um, but some of this is about just basic respect for humanity, and some of it is about respect for their chance to stay alive. Yep. And, you know, I don't catch Jason's last name, but just I'll call him Jason, Mr. Jason. Get it. Um, talked about nurses and so on, and Mr. Chair, we tried to get this done last year, and we were this close yep. to getting it done uh, out of the Senate, and I just was so proud of us on a bipartisan basis. But um, the nurses that Jason's family needs, they don't have to get the full scale. They just want to be able to be able to live their lives and pay their payments and help. The people mm -hmm. that are working as the home caregivers, mm -hmm. they could do so many other things, but they love their families. They become a part of the family. They, they, uh, they know where they're going. They know when their vacation is. They may go with them. Um, and they are connected to the family in a way that no other job can connect people. All they want to do is be able to afford to keep working there. Mm -hmm. And the, the pieces of legislation here don't bring them up to the same pay scale as a hospital nurse. And they don't deal with the isolation issues they get. I'm all alone. What do I do? But it does get them to the point that they actually can afford to go to work and do what they have to do so they have the opportunity to continue to serve and um, love on the families that they do. And I know it's on your mind. I know it's in Senate File 7. I know it's moving along as part of a bigger project. And I'm just so grateful that you as a chair and the committee is making it a priority. And I think I'm just really proud of that, too. Thank you, Senator Abler. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Lee. And thank you, um, Ms. Morgan. Um, 
we're going to lay this one over as well. Is that correct? Thank you. As amended. Thank you. As amended, uh, we're going to lay Senate File 903 over uh, for possible inclusion. So I think Senator May Quaid, you're the next contestant. Do you want to go, I guess I'd leave it up to you. Um, do you want to just go in order? Has there in there? Is that is that okay? Oh, Mr. Chair, your committee, your preference. That's, I'm looking at, you know, I want to really make sure that we have enough really good time to talk about medical assistance for yeah. employed people with disabilities. And so um, just um, looking at that. What if, Mr. Chair? Yeah, Matt, go ahead, Senator. What if we do um, in reverse order since we already kind of are 1272, 1201, 1020? Members, any uh, anybody opposed to that? I think that makes sense to me. Senator May Quaid, um, Senate File 1272. Looks like you have two amendments. You want to get those out in front of us first? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will move uh, the A1 amendment. It's a delete all. Members, any questions on the A1 amendment? It's the first stop. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. No nays? I got no nays on that. There was only one eye. <laughs> we passed. We're good. And so, welcome to this committee. Uh, A2. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the uh, A2 amendment. Um, this is really just cleaning up the language grammatically. Members, any questions on the A2? It is an author's amendment. I think uh, this is a really good bill. No questions. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Senator May Quaid, now that Senate file 1272 is in the order that you would like it, you have three people that are testifying, Rob Woodlick, Jillian Nelson, and Brittany Wilson. So come on down and grab a microphone, you three. And Senator May Quaid, um, present your bill. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'm excited to present to you 1272, which uh, like a bill we're going to hear, ends the unacceptable practice of taxing disability. Um, MAPD, or Medicaid for Employed People with Disabilities, is a critical Medicaid program in our state. It was established over 20 years ago to fill a gap in our Medicaid system to allow people who have disabilities and need long-term care supports to receive Medicaid services while also working and making an income, just like people who don't have disabilities. And while this program was created to make it easier for people with disabilities to work, the asset limit, the premiums, and the administrative burdens are a significant barrier to employment and keep people with disabilities living in poverty. Many accessing the program face financial distress as they are on, under constant threat of losing their safety nets. And so, Chair Hoffman, in 2021, you tasked this, a group of advocates to provide a bill that would make transformational changes needed to this critical program so people can prosper. This bill is from people directly impacted and people who are accessing the program. Each change would directly impact people with disabilities, their families, and others who use MAPD. Um, so here are the changes. It removes the asset limit and premium so people with disabilities can do more than just survive but also thrive. And I also just want to make a personal note on this, like requiring people to be poor to receive basic services to live not only really lowers their their quality of life, but it also doesn't allow them to pass anything on to their children and their families, and it's just a really horrific system that we have set up there. Um, this bill also expands eligibility for Medicare savings programs to all recipients who are dual eligible for MA and Medicare and required to enroll in Medicare, and ensures that those who have been disenrolled due to high premiums can re-enroll without penalty, and I think this is really important because we know that there are people who have not been able to pay the premiums that are not enrolled, and we'd like them to be able to be if they can. So you're going to hear from advocates who worked on this bill, but I think it's really important that we say this. People on MAPD are paying taxes. They pay for things like Medicare, they have private insurance, um, you know, they, they are doing all of those things. But they're being taxed on this one thing that they need, um, medical assistance, and they have one avenue to get it, and we make them pay to access it. And so this unnecessary tax is taxing disability. This is a cost savings for the state in relieving DHS and uh, other agencies of the administrative process and burden of calculating and collecting premiums, but mostly this is an economic justice and a disability justice issue, and I will turn it over to my testifiers to, testifiers to talk more about it. Any questions for, I'm smiling because you laid that out in, in such a brief way that got to the exact point of why 
two years ago when they said this was an issue, and I guess I yelled, well, then bring a bill. And, <laughs> and, and now the bill is, is there. So um, thank you for doing that. Rob Woodlick, yeah. you got, is there a microphone close to you? Do we need to get a wireless? Maybe the page can, I can't hear him. We're going to wow. get, can we get another mic? Okay. Do you want to go ahead? Um, I can start. Those are not accessible mic. microphones at the table. You'd think when they invented this building, they would have made some kind of, you know, way to make those microphones, like, move in and out, right? They pull out and toss it. Yeah. I can definitely start us off. You can do that instead. So we'll go ahead. Jillian Nelson, uh, please uh, welcome the committee. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, Chair Hoffman and committee members. I am Jillian Nelson. I'm the community resource and policy advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota. Many of you here know that I am an autistic adult, and I am a recipient of medical assistance for employed people with disabilities. This program changed my life. And I am here today asking you to support Senate File 1272. Paul Wellstone once said, it is the belief that the extremes and excess of inequality must be reduced so that each person is free to fully develop his or her potential. The current structure of MAEPD is built on a foundation of excess and extreme inequality, essentially charging a high tax and a heavy administrative burden for those living with the unchosen reality of being disabled. A study by the National Institute, Disability Institute in 2020 showed that people with disabilities pay over $17,000 a year more than a person without a disability just to exist. In the community, we call this the disability tax. This is all the things we pay extra for to live an accessible life like needing a mattress that will reduce chronic pain, sensory tools, or countless other things that I pay more for so that they can make my world as accessible as possible. For me, one of the biggest contributions to my disability tax is my MAEPD premiums. Every month I make choices. Pay my premiums or pay my car payment on time. Pay my premium or buy produce and non-processed protein pay my premium or pay my electric bill in full. I shouldn't have to make these choices. No one should have to make these choices. The choice, however, is very, very simple. Pay my premiums, because without them, I don't have the support I need to survive. MAPD premiums were put in place as a vehicle to give disabled people pride, so that we could feel pride in contributing. I rarely feel proud being forced to choose my premiums over everything else. I would be proud to be financially stable. I would be proud to have a savings account with more than two digits. I would be proud to someday be able to afford to buy a house. This is why we need to eliminate premiums for MAEPD. This change will not create a mass accumulation of wealth, but it will offer us some relief and reduce the cost of being disabled. It will be the start of lifting ourselves out of the forced poverty of the disability system. MAEPD participants are currently paying 7.5% of our income at only 150% of the federal poverty guideline. With the cost of living on the increase and the reality that most people with disabilities are underemployed and underpaid, 7.5% can make a big difference in quality of life and being stable. I do not need to pay my monthly premium to contribute. By working, I am contributing to my care. By being a taxpayer, and because Medicaid requires that I carry my primary insurance through my employer. That insurance is a greater contributor to my care needs than my premium will ever be. My private employer-based insurance pays an average of $80,000 a year before my MA is responsible for anything. So MAEPD only provides the, prime, the care that my primary does not, like occupational therapy, sensory therapy, and my PCAs. And you know, all of you know how vital PCAs are to this community. Those premiums and my insurance, the insurance, my primary insurance is how I contribute to my care as a disabled person. The elimination of MAEPD -E premiums would mean a better life for me and everyone else in this program. And as we learn from Paul Wellstone, we all do better 
when we all do better. Thank you for your time and your support of Senate File 1272. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Well done. The, um, those words echo huge, and if you want, his gavel is on my wall upstairs if you ever want to go take a look at it. And so um, we're getting, Rob, we're going to wait until you, we're going to get a mic. We're going to do this right. I'm not, you know, we're going to get a mic. Oh, you got to stand? But you got to stand? Work? You're good? You want to do it like that? All right. Well, can you, yeah. You good? All right. Rob Woodlick, welcome. All right. Thank you, uh, members of the committee, Chair Hoffman. Um, you know, you can hear Jillian. This is something that really impacts three of you in front of you today, um, three of us, and a lot more beyond this room. Um, you know, this, this program really is about equality and opportunity for people with disabilities. And um, so who here believes that people with disabilities should be able to pursue the same opportunities as you, anyone else in this room? And, you know, I'm, I'm a quadriplegic. That's, I'm, I'm trying to get that changed in a whole other way, but, um, it's going to take a lot, and until then, you know, it's about four hundred thousand dollars. If I had to pay out of pocket, if I lost my disability benefits from the state, I can't afford that. I'd have to choose between work or, you know, keeping my caregivers, and that's not really a choice. So you get out of bed, you can't, you know, you can't live like that. Um, you know, I want to work. I want to contribute to the community, and I want to build opportunity, just like you and everyone else. Um, I work as a med device engineering consultant um, and clinical trial project manager at the University of Minnesota. And I uh, also have a company that makes and designs assistive technology and med devices. Uh, I'm in the process of hiring five people, actually, so that's pretty fun. But, um, but, you know, no matter how much I make, unless I really won the lottery or landed, you know, somehow got really lucky, um, I'm still going to need these services. The services are approved by a doctor. They're not people that can just waltz in there and sign up for this program. Um, you know, and at a certain point with the current rules, I would have to give away my company if it succeeds. That's the reality. Um, there's no financial bridge to gap this financial independence, you know, of true, true independence if I wanted to go off disability. Um, imagine being in a situation where you can't legally hold enough assets to put down a down payment on a house or a car, assessed of cars for wheelchairs are around 80, 90,000 nowadays. Um, you have to turn down employee stock options, turn down a raise for fear it puts you over the asset limit, have a safety net to fall back on, leaving your career behind because it doesn't make sense to work. These are all things that I've, these are all like real things that my friends have dealt with, and we've tried to figure out how to help them. That's why we're here today, so, um, to generate financial stability for people with disabilities. So, you know, all these situations um, can be solved, and, you know, that's, I'm here addressing the asset limit, we want to eliminate it, and, you know, I want to, I want to address a little bit about the fiscal note. Um, you know, funds generated from this will probably offset other programs. So if you see a high price tag, these people on disabilities, they're not, they're still going to be on disability. It just depends if they're going to be working or not. Also, um, this will reduce administrative burden um, by, it's a lot of work for me to get my documents together. It's a lot of work for administrators to put that into the system and do their analysis. So it's keeping individuals like Myself, Jillian here, Brittany, who you hear next, and I mean, it's it's heartbreaking. Um, you know, we want to pursue the American dream and keep going. So, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, questions, comments? And, and you guys just stick around, and we're going to have some. We'll have some conversation after. Miss Brittany Wilson, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you to Chair Hoffman and committee members for allowing me to testify on this bill. <clears throat> My name is Brittany Wilson, and I'm honored to be here today to speak to you about a program that I have been fortunate to be on for over a decade. 
I was born with a joint and muscle condition and navigate life uh, using this electric wheelchair. And like so many others in the disability community, I grew up with an understanding that if I made too much money, I would be kicked off of social security and state services that I need to live, including the caddy waiver and personal care assistance. And because of this, upon graduating, I didn't look for a job. And it wasn't until about two years after graduating that I learned about the Disability Hub and made a call that would change my life. During this call, this was the first time that I had heard about MAEPD. I learned that I could work while earning a competitive wage and still get the help that I needed. And honestly, I couldn't believe it. I felt so lucky to live in a state and still do where a program like this is available. And this is why we want to ensure that notice is given to people with disabilities accessing MA of the existence of MAEPD. This program was implemented before I graduated high school. Every year at my IEP meetings and caddy waiver reassessments when I was asked about my goals, every year I mentioned working. Every year I mentioned moving out on my own, owning a home, and still no one told me about this program. Even when I started working in my senior year, earning a competitive wage, no one told me about this program. It was my persistence, my willpower, my stubbornness, and my privilege that helped me find out about this life-changing program. And once I learned about MAEPD, you better believe I rolled down to Ramsey County the next day and applied. Um, and at that time, I was also informed that I needed to apply for Medicare. And if I were eligible, that I would be required to enroll in Medicare. And of course, born with a disability, I was approved. Currently, if your income is less than $20,179, or 200% of the federal poverty guidelines, you can have your Medicare Part B premiums reimbursed. How many of you could live on $27,180 on as a single person and also pay the additional healthcare costs on top of these premiums? Expanding the eligibility for Medicaid, uh, Medicare savings program will help financially stabilize individuals who are duly eligible for MA and Medicare, which, by the way, is most people on this program. This is about barely making it by and then being forced to pay into two or three different healthcare programs just so we can work. If we are requiring working people to utilize other types of healthcare, we need to actually ensure that they can afford them. We want to end these kinds of barriers to employment, and Senate File 1272 is going to benefit the people already accessing the program, and specifically those with lower incomes. It's going to help those people the most. This is the only way that working people with disabilities who need home and community-based services can access them. This is the only option that we have and we have to pay to access it while also working, paying our taxes and other health care costs. Simply put, this bill is about equity. Our health and human service programs are supposed to get people with disabilities and other folks that use them to the starting line. Unfortunately, many cannot even get there because of the barriers of the asset limits and premiums and other administrative barriers that the current program has. Why do we keep putting this additional burden on people with disabilities just to get the care that we need? This is truly a tax on disability. I started this testimony by letting you know that I've been on this program for over a decade. And today, it's my honor to say that I am the Equity and Justice Director of the ARC Minnesota, a job that I could not have without MAEPD. Every day, I get to help advocate for thousands of Minnesotans with disabilities. I get to be the representation that I was searching for growing up. When parents and advocates come to me and ask me about working and how I've managed it with my services, I, we, you, get to tell them that there is hope for the future. I remind them that there is a pathway for their children to do more than survive, but to also thrive. 
And thriving looks like not being terrified to lose my care while also struggling to pay for the premiums and Medicare costs just so that I can be in the workforce. Thriving means that I and we deserve to work and be a part of society while also having access to the support that we need to survive. It has been 20 years since this incredible program was implemented. And in that time, people on this program have found the gaps and barriers that stop us from living our full potential, that make people choose between the impossible. Reform is overdue. Thank you so much for being here today and hearing this. Thank you. Thank you. Um. If there's one thing somebody asked, I was asked, what would be like a number one priority for you this year? And this is it for me personally, just because of what that's all about, Brittany. Um, that here, go get a job. We, you know, here's Olmstead, 1998. Here's what we're going to do. We put this cabinet together. We do this. Yet the system doesn't support where we want to be, right? And, and this is a way of starting to change that system, right? And, and we, know the, we know the department wants to do exactly that, get into independence, right? I mean, we, two years ago, this committee, it was our theme. Was it two years ago? Independence, and I mean it, right? Jim and Omar, I mean, wasn't it? We mean it, right? Independence, and we mean it. Um, I'm grateful you brought this bill forward. Uh, I'm grateful that you are driving this to get us to wake up and all the conversation about what's going on out there. You know what, nothing, that doesn't matter. This is what matters. And I, I really, I just am, I'm, I pre, I'm appreciative. So members, any questions? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator Mayquaid, for uh, bringing this bill into all the testifiers for sharing your stories today. Um, Mr. Chair, a question for the bill author or any of the testifiers. I had a constituent who um, was employed with a disability, and they told me a story about how literally the, the payroll office at their employer would call them when they you know, were getting close to earning too much money that month, and they're going to start losing their benefits and effectively uh, face a what I would call a... Uh, greater than 100% tax rate, where if they earned an extra dollar, they would lose more than a dollar. And so um, my question for the bill author is, th does this bill address that? Um, does it get at that piece? And for the additional cost that would be potentially associated with this, is there a, um, does the federal cost share apply to this? Will, will the federal government be picking up a substantial portion of this bill, or is it all going to be funded through state dollars? Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. You get to the point. Senator Mayquade, and actually, then there's also, I think Rob's probably got an answer to that. I, yeah, it's absolutely, that's the exact same thing that we're, we're hearing. If you make $1 more than poverty, right, 100% more, $1 more than 100% of poverty, oh, by the way, we're going to do this to you, yet at the same time we're saying do that. So, Senator Mayquaid, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and Senator Rasmussen, and I think our testifiers could probably speak to the, the lived experience of it. I think it's really important to know that the, the premiums themselves don't sustain the program. They're kind of performative. The, the fees that people pay are, are really substantial for their income, but they do not in any way cover the costs of services that people need to live independently. And so, um, the and so that would be the answer to the part of that. Like this doesn't remove, I mean, this all goes into the general fund, right? And so this is um, basically just extra taxes to people for dis with having a disability. Um, and I don't, I don't know the origin of this program and what the purpose of the fees was, um, but it doesn't change any of the cost sharing measures from the federal government or, or you know, assume more of the cost between Medicare, Medicaid, state dollars, federal dollars. It just doesn't require them to continue to keep paying substantial fees to access the program. Did I answer your question? Yes. And I can uh, look to our testifiers too. Rob. Yeah, and, and I mean, in short term, yeah, absolutely eliminating the asset limit is the problem that your constituent had an issue with. Um, and this would, you know, eliminate that problem or reduce the burden if for some reason it's, you know, negotiated to increase it. Um, 
but maintaining it at 20,000 is not sustainable. Um, it's not a safety net, especially for somebody with a disability. So. 6501 was that there was always this statement about you know m medical assistance for employed people with disabilities. You got to make sixty five dollars and one cent, mm. and then you can get your benefits. I mean that was this the sixty five oh one thing that you would hear, and it's like I don't know when that was set up. Maybe there was a certain member here at the table, and when that person was in the other body, they might have done that like in the nineties. But I don't know when that was. Um, but that's just one of those things. It's like now's the time to grow up because of the fact, you know, we want people working. People want to work, right? I love, I love where you're going with that question. So, Miss Jillian. Um, thank you, Senator Hoffman. I'm um, Senator Rasmussen. I think the benefits that your um, constituent is referring to are the Social Security benefits. Um, before I came to the Autism Society, I was an employment consultant for people with disabilities, so I know quite a bit about this. Um, this does not actually change that protection. That is a federal program that there is still a lot of talk on the Hill about moving those income limits on Social Security on, on, in DC. But what this program does, what MAPD does, and it, it allows people to maintain the benefits that they need to live. Social security is a supplemental income. If you can work full time and earn a livable wage, you don't need to continue making that money from social security. But you still need your PCA, you still need your wheelchair, you still need sensory therapy, you still need occupational therapy, you need all those things that Medicaid provides for you. So by reducing the asset limitations and by reducing the premiums, we're not gonna solve the social security problem, but we're gonna give back. So if you aren't paying 7.5% of your income, the dependency on the social security income decreases. If we are removing that disability tax and lowering that disability tax, then people won't necessarily need to depend on outside income because they are free to excel and grow and develop careers in their field of choice and become self-sustaining with just services and supports that are allowing them to continue to be taxpayers and contribute to our economy and our communities. I wanna, I wanna add maybe Go ahead, Rob. some context. Um, you know, when I started working uh, 2017, so I was still, I was on social security disability from my injury in 2011. Um, and I went to the Social Security office. You, they have, I think it's, I think it's the Ticket to Ride program. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a, kind of this time mm -hmm. period to transition. If you mm -hmm. make enough money, you know, you can maintain it for a little bit of time to bridge that gap. Especially if you're starting out your career, it's really helpful. And not really sure, you know, I, I'm, I had a lot of insecurity of how much I could contribute, how much I could maintain a workload um, when I first started, because you just don't know. And, um, and my health is number one. I mean, that's kind of, if you don't have basic health, you're kind of not able to work. So um, that, I don't pay Social Security Disability. I pay into the Social Security program now. Um, and hopefully maybe someday I'll collect retirement benefits. But like, yeah, everyone. And, um, but I pay, my, what I pay today is I pay my Medicare, I pay my state premium for this program, and I also pay uh, into my employer health insurance, so, yeah. Senator, thank you. It's, I, I like how you did a Beatles reference there on Ticket to Ride, that was, uh, that was pretty, it was pretty good, Rob. I was thinking, ticket to work, ticket to work, yeah. and then you just ticket to ride. I'm gonna call it Ticket to Ride from here on out. Senator <laughs> Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. If we're through with the MAEPD discussion, I have a question kind of related to the last bill to Mr. Wedlock. Are we ready for that? I think so. All right. Uh, he stopped. I, I've known Rob a long time, and I'm just continuing to be impressed with his courage and the way he, and with all of everybody. It's just like so this committee just, just drives you uh, deep inside your soul. Um, anyway, so um, Maybe you want to introduce your, uh, your care provider and, and tell us uh, how long you've had him and, and how great it's been to have so many care providers in your life. Mr. This is Wilder, Al. Um, he's one of my nurses, and this is his first day. <laughs> so. And, uh, and so, Mr. Chair, there is an incredibly intact system to help Mr. Wedlick find staff 
And so, how did you happen to find Al, Mr. Wedlick? Mr. Yeah. Mr. Wedlick. I don't want to violate uh, my other nurse's hip, HIPAA oh. things, but yeah, it's word of mouth. And I mean, you know, it's incredibly difficult to find caregivers. My mom is my primary caregiver, and yeah. It's, it's Mr. Hey, Mr. Senator Abel, I think I saw Rob's mom is here someplace. Is she so here? I thought so. There, there she, she is, is, in the back of the room. Oh, yeah, it's incredible. But, Mr. Chair, to, Senator the, Abler. to the system, I mean, there's, um, and, and I don't want to tell all your secrets, Mr. Wedlick, but it's like, uh, care is thin. And uh, he relies on his mom for the informal care that he's entitled to much more formal care. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but Mr. Chair, without assistance, uh, Mr. Wedlick will be sitting just in that position for quite a while. And it grieves me. And other, we learned about Dan, who was not so fortunate to have a mom around. Mm -hmm. And just to illustrate, and it just, I hope this is okay. I told you I might ask, and this is as far as I'm going to go. But to put, and to the rest, you know, I, I forgot your name, but it's just so inspiring. Um, so you put a face to the deal. It's not just a bunch of faceless folks somewhere. These are our neighbors and, and uh, you know, to Senator May Quay, the MAEPD thing is just so important. There are people turning down promotions. They can make good money and actually do really well, but because of some technicalities that aren't even going to save any money, they don't get to take that raise and get to go on a vacation. Uh, and just for no good reason. So Senator May Quaid, you're on to a really good bill here. And, and thank you. I'll, I'll stop, yeah. Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I mean, to what you're trying to get me to say, um, you know, my mom's 77 and has Parkinson's. And, you know, God bless her soul. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to have my mom be able to take care of me. She's a former nurse and, um, you know, loves taking care of me. But when, she doesn't want to do that when she's 80. And, you know, that's, that's the reality of what we're, what some people, many people like me are facing. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I mean, there's, I've got friends laying in nursing homes that are, I, with, without my mom, without at all, I'd be laying in bed. I wouldn't be sitting in this chair, so. Can I comment on what you said too, Senator Abler? Um, I was You got a way for me to say yes. Yeah. Jillian, Never tell Mr. Me no. Rule Breaker here, Jillian Nelson. You know. it's, it's a rebellion, Mr. It's Chair. It's a rebellion. So. You're taking oh, over this. Go ahead, Jillian. I was offered a raise this year um, because I'm good at my job. I lose 25% of that raise every month to MAPD premiums. I make less than your average legislator every year. And I am paying approximately $550 a month for health care every single month. That is why I make the choices I make. Even when there is room for growth, I, I don't get to take the full step forward. I get to take half a step forward and then a slight little leap backwards and hope that it balances out. My boss calls me before any changes in my, in my benefits or my pay because they need to make sure it's not gonna harm my benefits and that I wouldn't actually end up losing money taking a promotion or a raise. That's a tough choice to make. That is a very, very tough choice to make. I grew up in poverty um, and I've worked very, very hard. When I was diagnosed autistic, I was actually homeless and an addict. And I have worked so hard to build stability and to know that the program that keeps me stable is also the program that keeps me from truly thriving and building something to fall back on if there were to be a crisis in my life is a very narrowing reality to live with. Senator Abler. I'm done, Mr. Chair. I don't know how you top any of that. I, I I just, I'm so grateful that this amazing panel came down today. I, I'm, I, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm just absolutely grateful you guys took up the challenge last year. I mean, I, I don't know what, who cares? I Tax the rich. Give me more money, Jim. I, I just, 
Uh, you know, I, I'm kidding. That's an inside Mr. joke, you guys. That's now it's going to be out. And, you Would know, you like me to write you know, that bill too? <laughs> well, Mr. Chair, I just like to announce there's enough money in the budget. You don't have to tax the rich. You have your 1.8, 1, 1.825 1. billion. It, Senator Mayquade, how that? much is sitting in the uh, 1.1? Mr. Chair, I've heard it's 1.825 billion. Billions, and a little bit more that we can tack that on and get this fixed. So there's actually. It's a matter of deciding what's important in our priority. Yeah. And, and Mr. Chair, I've been somewhat ungenerous with my comments about the governor, and I just am hoping that he'll catch on to this. But I do have to dis disclaim that many people at the department share my concern. And so uh, they are really good people there doing their best, yeah. working in the parameters that have been put on them from above. And, um, but this is a time, Mr. Chair, and the home care and the MEPD and many of the things, uh, nursing homes, et cetera, that are just so important. Uh, there's a new budget coming from the governor, Mr. Chair, and this may be a good time for some enhancements. I, it would be great. I, you know, and I, I wonder on this, Senator May Quaid, I, I don't know what the cost, you know, I don't care what the cost, I mean, let's, let's get the fiscal note and then figure out what we need to do. I mean, this one in TEFRA are just ones that have been hounding me, and I know that's next on it. But you three, I just, I, I don't know what I can say, except I'm grateful for you and appreciate you and keep up what you're doing. And um, uh, we, we need you. We need you to be here. We need you to be the ones telling us what we're doing wrong and what we need to do what's right. So thanks for being here. Members, anyone? All right. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're gonna. Are we laying this over, team? Are we doing? What are we doing here? Are we laying this bill over? Ms. Possible inclusion. Is that? Mr. Chair, I would imagine because we don't have a fiscal note yet, it should be laid over for possible inclusion. But if I may be so bold as to advocate for possibly a mini omnibus with this in Tefra, once that's ready. I'm I'd be for it. absolutely love that idea. I mean, I was even going to ask maybe we should just send it to finance and make them, you know, figure it out because this is like yes. You, no, I'm getting yes. a no over here. <laughs> mini omnibus, all right. Members, are you guys mini omnibus or no? <laughs> Hi, Senator Wickland. How are you? I'm glad you're back with us. It's good. So, Senator Mayquade, so um, with that, we'll, as amended, uh, we'll uh, lay this over for possible inclusion. Thank you for your work on this. I appreciate that. What's up, Senator? What's, what do you want to do next? 1201 or 1020? 1201, please, Mr. Chair. Senate file 1201, Senator May Quaid, parental contribution fees for children with disabilities elimination. TEFRA. Thank you. Welcome. Did my homework, Mr. Chair. I just got to get to the right folder. You're fine. Um, you want to introduce your, your colleague there next to you? My constituent. Your constituent. Um, so... Uh, Members of the committee, Mr. Chair, uh, TEFRA, this is, this is similar to our previous bill. So TEFRA is the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act. This allows parents uh, to receive in-home supports and medical services for their children with disabilities um, through MA, um, supplemental to private insurance. However, they're subjected to a sliding scale fee that's drastically increased over time. And parents whose children access waivers also have to access or pay a parental fee. And this can be hundreds or even thousands of dollars a month. There's actually a, a calculator that you can go to on the DHS website, and I went and I calculated how much I would have to pay if I had a child, which I do have a child, but if she was on, um, uh, if I, we were paying TEFRA fees, and it would be more than our mortgage. So it would be a whole second house plus. Um, because of this cost, a lot of parents are driven deep into debt, maxing out credit cards, 401ks, um, taking out second mortgages on their homes. Others forego critical services and supports for their children because they honestly can't afford the fees. And so this is, again, an additional tax on parents whose children have disabilities, ones that people cannot afford, and it places the health and safety and success of Minnesota children at risk. And so, you know, these fees do not, again, much like the MAEPD, they don't fund fund the costs of services that uh, these children are getting in home. Um, and that just, this is not the values that we have for the state of Minnesota. And so this bill would uh, eliminate uh, parental TEFRA fees and help the Minnesotans be able to keep just a little bit more of their money and, and support their children. Um, I believe I have an amendment, Mr. Chair, if I can move that. I do, the A1. I do, yes. I the A1 amendment. amendment. Mm -hmm. So moved. 
So moved. Po- folks, the A1 amendment's in front of you. Senator May Quaid moves the A1 amendment. Any questions, comments, nothing? Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Aww. Senator May Quaid, now that the bill is in the frame and reference and order that you'd like, um, did you want to uh, introduce us to Kelly Kauzel? And then you got a couple other people, too, that are on Zoom. You have Jessica Hauser and Dr. Amy Esler, who's uh, going to join us via Zoom. So... Uh, Senator May Quaid. Yes, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, this is my constituent. Her name is Kelly. She has a son named Noah and a husband named Mike. Um, one of the most incredible advocates I've had the pleasure of meeting. I'm very, very grateful. She is my constituent. She's going to talk a little bit about TEFR fees, what that means for her family, and why this bill is so important. Really Thank you. Ms. Kauzel, welcome. Thank you. Um, Senator Hoffman and chair members, my name is Kelly Kauzel. Um, I have a son, Noah, who's 14 years old now, so we have been on TEFRA for the last 12, 12 years. Um, I am going to just jump behind and then jump forward. Um, we've maxed out every single credit card. Um, my transmission went out of my van. I still own my vehicles. Um, they're 293,000 miles, but we really don't want to get new vehicles because that would just be adding to our debt. Um, so that's kind of the behind. Um, the forward is um, four years ago, um, Senator Aaron McQuaid had told me about food instability in our own, where we live. And I decided to get a uh, volunteer position um, in the school lunchroom, which um, it's turned into a two hour, a 2.5 hour, a four hour, um, and I could be a manager, but I'm not going to be a manager because I shouldn't even be working in the first place because it just all goes to Tafara. Um, so going back to uh, 2021, um, my cousin Jill, who lived in who lived in Anoka, um, had breast cancer. She was diagnosed with bone cancer, and so we kind of knew that it would be her last year to live. Um, and so I would do my part by driving from Apple Valley to Anoka, um, in and out of the hospital, in and out of TCUs, a medical transportation not showing up. So I would have to um, basically help um, because there was no other family members to help. Um, it got more complicated than that. She ended up being allergic to five different antibiotics. So her antibiotics had to be through an IV, which um, most TCUs um, would not accept her. So wherever she would go, I would have to go um, to you know just help with medical appointments and things like that. Um, so yeah, so I basically was trying to help her um, and advocate for her. I was doing everything for her, and um, she since passed away in July of 2022. So with all that going on, um, we also had a, ba- uh, a bathroom remodel through Noah's waiver because he has tight hamstrings. And so there was some things in our bathroom we needed to do. We had all that going on. So all of our basement was in our garage this past summer. Um, and then after Jill died, I also had another friend. Her name was Tracy. She quit work after she made her daughter's last TEFRA payment. She just wanted to make sure the TEFRA was paid. And once the TEFRA was paid and she went to the doctor, she had stomach cancer, a very aggressive form of stomach cancer, and she died in six weeks. And so besides grieving for my cousin Jill, I was also trying to help that family during the past summer and take Callie as much as possible um, because that also was a very, very huge loss. Come to September, I had um, the Minnesota Department of Revenue after me um, because I had not paid my TEFRA fees. And um, I tried to explain that life this past year was really, really um, chaotic. um, And I was trying to care for multiple people besides my son. 
Um, and my life was uh, pretty much upside down. So that's basically what it's been since, for some of you, the last time I've been here. Um, I'm working in a school kitchen. We are short-staffed in a school kitchen. They beg me to work more hours. Um, I will do a sub-manager, but I can't do this every week because the amount of money that I make and the amount that I pay for Tefra, I should not be working this part-time job. And I'm just going to pretty much leave it at that. Thank you, Ms. Kozel. Um Any questions, members? Thank you for talking about that lived experience of I'm working, but it costs me more to do that. My kids got unique and individualized needs. I got to do that. I mean, it's this stress balance that's there. Senator Mayquaid, you have a couple of people on Zoom, Jessica Hauser and Dr. Amy Essler. So Jessica, do you want to go next? I would be happy to. Thank you, Senator. Welcome. All right. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. All right. Um, here we go. Pull up my... There we are. Um, good afternoon, and thank you to all the lawmakers and caregivers working hard to improve access to disability services in Minnesota. My name is Jessica Hauser. I'm mom to Wyatt. He's 10 years old and was diagnosed with a catastrophic form of epilepsy when he was seven months old. He has seizures every day, and you might be hearing him in the background, <laughs> and requires one-on-one -on -one adult care with everything. He also requires multiple medical supports and interventions, including medications, therapies, and durable medical equipment. We've also had to modify our home to ensure that it's accessible and safe for him to live in. To cover the cost of his care, we were encouraged to apply for medical assistance when he was about two years old. This is a secondary insurance for, because our family's primary insurance did not adequately cover his medical expenses. We began navigating that complicated application process with the support of the ARC. We discovered that in order to access medical assistance, we would have to pay an extraordinary amount of money called a parental fee through the TEFRA program, which stands for Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act. This name is stunningly inaccurate. It's tremendously expensive and a punitive tax on families who have children with devastating disabilities. It also creates a layer of red tape and bureaucracy that families have to navigate on top of dealing with the difficult, often heartbreaking experience of having a very sick child. And it feels downright cruel. The initial fee for our family was equal to another mortgage payment, which was over $1,000 a month when we first applied. This was when my husband and I both worked full time. At the time, I was making a six-figure income in a career that I loved. Since the fee is a sliding scale based on income, no matter how we did the math, it always ended up with one of us quitting our job to ensure that we had the proper insurance to care for our son. Medical assistance isn't an optional choice for us to care for our son. He needs that support. First, my husband stayed home with him for a year. And then he went back to work and I quit my career mm -hmm. so we could afford to pay the TEFRA fee and make sure that my son has a high quality of life. No Minnesotan should have to choose between working and contributing to the state economy and going bankrupt to pay for the care of their disabled child. When Wyatt started school, I was able to go back to work but only on a part-time basis. And I'm careful not to make too much money in fear of a higher parental fee. We cannot move forward financially while we're forced to pay this egregious tax. And it's absurd. Minnesota needs to do better for families who have children with disabilities. Stop adding to their grief by taxing them for working hard to care for their families and kids. Thank you so much for your time and supporting SF1201 to help families like mine live better lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Hauser. Dr. Amy Elser. 
Hi. Thank you, Chair Hoffman and committee members for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Amy Essler. I'm a resident of St. Paul, Minnesota and the mother of an eight-year-old boy with a history of prematurity born at 29 weeks. My Senator is Claire Omu Verbaten, who is a co-author of this bill. I also am an associate professor in pediatrics at the University of Minnesota, a licensed psychologist specializing in autism and genetic disorders, and I'm currently the co-director of clinical services at the Masonic Institute for the Developing Brain. I'm here today to support Senate uh, Bill 1201, which eliminates parental fees for programs like TEFRA. In my professional role in diagnosing and supporting autistic individuals and their families, I can point to countless families who have been able to access needed services for their child because we had the TEFRA program. I have no doubt that because these services were provided, many children achieved their goals that allowed them to participate in their communities in the ways important to them. I can also share countless examples of families who are not able to access coverage through TEFRA due to high parent co-pays. But I wanna talk about one family in particular, which is my best friend, Jennifer, and her son, Henry. Henry was born a few months after my son. Both of our babies ended up having extended stays in the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit, mine for prematurity and hers for an unexpected diagnosis of Williams syndrome. Williams syndrome is a rare genetic disorder that often comes with mild to moderate delays in cognitive development, as well as difficulties with attention, anxiety, social skills, and self-regulation. Henry had stark delays in language and motor skills in early childhood. While my son had mild speech delays that were easily remedied through speech language therapy covered by my private insurance, Henry was not talking or walking independently at age two or three. Despite the known course of Williams syndrome and the obvious delays in development impacting Henry's daily life and his ability to participate with same age peers, my friend Jenny's insurance provided coverage for only one speech language session and one occupational therapy session per month. No problem, I said, you can just apply for TEFRA and Henry's disability will qualify him. Jenny went through the extensive and overly complex process of completing the TEFRA application only to find out that their family income was at a level where copay was equal to their mortgage. Their choice was to pay for TEFRA or to pay for daycare. And as parents working full time, they chose daycare. Thankfully, Henry talks and walks today at age eight, but his language and motor skills are far behind that of his same age peers, and he is in a full-time special education classroom. He continues to need speech language and occupational therapies and continues to qualify for one session per month through his private insurance. We know the power of early intervention and we will always wonder whether Henry could have made more extensive gains had TEFRA been affordable. There are so many ways in which our systems fail to support and include people with disabilities. I ask the committee to support SF-1201 and remove one barrier for families seeking needed supports and services. I thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, doctor. Any questions for uh, Ms. Hauser or Dr. Esler or Ms. Kausel? Um, I know uh, Senator McQuaid, I don't see anybody raising their hand right now or cutting me off. So there is, we got some, we put in financial requests or fiscal note requests on, I, I just found out from, from staff, from um, Mr. Ryan, that, that, that stuff is being um, gone through the, you know, gone through the line of, of where that is. So I don't, I don't know. We're going to probably do the same thing here. Wait. We're going to create some kind of little mini omnibus is what we're going to try to do. I, I kind of like that, actually. Anybody like that? Senator Abler, you like that idea? I like it just to remind everybody that uh, this body was uh, very interested in doing this uh, a couple different times. Yes. And we're uh, over. Um, just couldn't quite. Why did the TEFRA not get across the road is the question. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> across the road, meaning the other body. So oh, yeah, to get across. Right, yeah. see. So I... Uh, so I think that Senator May Quaid, you've got a whole army behind you here of people who want to, or whatever you call um, whatever this gaggle is up here. But, um, but so uh, just keep working. Uh, Senator Hoffman will bring it up in conference and keep pushing and pushing. So absolutely. So, so will all of us, and Senator May Quaid as well. So thank, and 
Thanks. Senator McQuaid, thank you. Uh, just a little known fact that I, the first the first per diem check I got as a state senator was withheld mm -hmm. because I owed TEFRA money to the state of Minnesota. So uh, this is real. Yeah. I mean, I just... It's it just, personal. Yes. Seriously, Jim. The, the, the first... I'll never forget that. It was like, yeah. So um, it's probably somewhere in the public archives, but, you know, that was 10 years ago. But I... I absolutely, um, I, I absolutely am grateful that you're doing this too. Thank you. Nice to see you again. So, members, anything? Nope. We're going to lay this over to our soon-to-be developed mini omnibus. So, as amended, right? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Awesome. So, you got uh, 1020 is up. Correct. And central community supports modifications. You got Mr. Sam Smith from the. Uh, Alzheimer's Association and yes. Carolyn Aldani. Yes. Did I get that close? Because if I didn't, will you please correct me? Yes, you did. I did. Did you hear that, team? I got that close. So Italian. that's pretty good. Mr. Chair, I do have a um, the A1 amendment. As you well. do like A1 that. amendment. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Senator May Quaid's got the A1 amendment. All those in favor, say aye. Post same sign. Thank you, Senator. Now that it's in the form and the the way you want it, uh, welcome. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. So um, this bill will um, put into uh, funding something that I think existed before in 2021, um, but it adds uh, respite care services and expands respite care services um, and establishes a grant program. And I'm sure my testifiers can speak more to it, but we do have, um, it's not even a looming crisis anymore, it is a present crisis of Alzheimer's in the state of Minnesota and across the country and making sure that people have access to um, respite care and that caregivers have access to respite care is, is incredibly important to make sure that we um, have people who are being cared for and that we don't have caregiver burnout, which we know is a, a very uh, present and ongoing crisis. And so I'll, I'll turn over to my testifiers to talk a little bit more about the bill, why it's important, but um, thank you for your time hearing it. Thank you, Senator May Quaid, once again, for bringing an awesome bill. Mr. Sam Smith, are you going first? State Affairs Manager for the Alzheimer's Association. Welcome to the committee. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Sam Smith, and I'm here on behalf of the Alzheimer's Association to testify in support of Senate File 1020 and the loved ones who provide care for someone living with Alzheimer's and other form of dementia. Alzheimer's disease is a public health crisis that demands urgent action from policymakers. In 2020, there were 99,000 Minnesotans living with Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. That number is expected to increase by 21.2% by 2025. This comes at great personal cost to Minnesota families, yet the state feels these imp impacts as well. Minnesota spent $905 million a year in 2020 on Alzheimer's disease and other dementia in Medicaid, and these costs are projected to increase. The challenges facing the long-term workforce are well documented, and we support efforts this committee is taking to address this crisis. However, not enough attention is paid to unpaid caregivers and the foundational role they play in keeping loved ones at home, where they want to be, and out of more expensive and intensive settings like an assisted living or nursing home. In 2021, 171,000 Minnesota caregivers provided 156 million hours of unpaid care valued at $3.4 billion. This comes at a cost. The stress and emotional toll of caring for a loved one with dementia leads to higher rates of chronic conditions like depression and, or hypertension, and caregivers are burning out at increasing rates. Caregiver burnout is a leading reason for placement in a more expensive residential setting. Our long-term system is already in crisis, and we can't afford to go back. I'm going to cut my testimony briefly and just note that in a meeting with a caregiver, when I discussed our respite care legislation, I was told that caring for someone with dementia was the hardest job she's ever had. We can and must do more. Expanding access to respite care will allow more people with dementia to be where they want to be, at home with the people they love. Thank you for your time and support of Senate File 1020 and to Senator May Quaid and our authors for carrying this important legislation. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, um, any questions for Mr. Smith, members? No? Um, Ms. Aldeny. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hoffman and distinguished committee members for listening to my testimony today. My name is Carolyn Aldani. I'm a resident of the Twin Cities and was a caregiver to my husband over seven years. 
My test testimony speaks to three facets of my experience. First, my family's journey with dementia. Second, key learnings. And lastly, why this bill would address critical unmet needs in our communities. Carl and I were married for 39 years, raised th three children, and welcomed two granddaughters together. Carl became a stay-at-home dad when our youngest child was born. Years later, Carl was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at age 62. I was 54. We were devastated, but quickly turned to the Alzheimer's Association to develop a path forward. I continued to work for five years after Carl's diagnosis, hiring in-home caregivers to increasing schedule as the disease advanced. I retired at age 59 and, ca and cared for Carl full-time in our home for the last two years of his life. During that time, I constructed a critical network of part-time caregivers, adult day programs, support groups, therapists, and eventually hospice services to fill gaps that family and friends could not. Carl died peacefully at home on winter solstice 2022 with his family surrounding him. We love him dearly. My most significant learning from our journey is the importance of planning. In the famous words of a hockey legend, you have to think about where the puck is going to be. My self-care and mental health management was a vital element of our increasingly demanding care plan. The most prevalent theme I heard in several support groups was dealing with caregiver stress and burnout. Many caregivers said, I had to put my loved one into a care facility. I wasn't getting enough sleep, was overwhelmed by grief, and no longer was healthy. My experience mirrored that theirs, especially when Carl's nocturnal care increased with his incontinence and troubled sleep. As my sleep became more fragmented, I felt exhausted, distraught, and without reprieve. I learned that providing 7 by 24 care without routine respite and professional services is not sustainable, even with lots of help from family and friends. Why is SF1020 important to our communities? We all see the growing needs of the aging population. There are simply not enough caregivers in our communities, even with growing senior care facilities, as evidenced by long wait lists. Also, many people cannot bear the cost of these facilities for very long, if at all. It is critical that we cultivate affordable in-home care options. This bill provides caregiver respite and essential services to allow seniors to live in their homes longer and to support unpaid caregivers. I fortunately could afford these crucial benefits. Unfortunately, many families cannot. In summary, I, like many caregivers, am eternally grateful for the life I shared with my spouse and wanted to care for him. I miss him well. I learned a lot from this profound experience and would like to help others be successful caregivers. Unpaid caregivers are necessary heroes who urgently require our support. My sincere appreciation to Senator Hoffman and to this committee for the opportunity to advocate for this important bill, SF-1020. I welcome any questions you may have. Members. Thank you, Ms. Aldani. So I have a question. There's, it looks like there's, a, there's an ask, mm -hmm. and I just am wondering, since our good finance chair has said send him bills. Mr. Um, chair, you stole the words. Is that what you were thinking you were wanting to do? Mm -hmm. Senator Abler just said that <laughs> like two seconds ago. Senator Abler, what's your thought on I mean we did it we did it once. I mean I 
I just wanted to throw it out there to say, is this something we want to do as a group, or do we want to lay this over? I need some help. Uh, Mr. Chair, just uh, if you're asking my advice, I, I think you want to premeditate what you send out. Um, there's a, you know, we're working on the Senate File 7 project, which hopefully will have a life of its own and its own target. And then later, um, there's me, I think, I, don't, I could be wrong. There may just be a free-for-all in the caucus. Whoever can get the money out first gets it. But I have a feeling there's going to be a more coordinated effort. I mean, Senator May Quaid has information I don't have. It's like, first out, get the money, in which case, I'd say go for it. Um, but I think there's going to be a discussion about targets in various committees, and the governor may have an opinion eventually. You may even have try targets earlier. You may just have our own, and we want to haggle. So I don't know how it's going to go. But I would just, if you wanted my advice, I would suggest you... Uh, Premeditate and at least let people know what you're doing. If you do uh, like clusters, or but that will be used against whatever target you're going to have. Is my thought. So no, I appreciate your your history and your reference to if anybody understands how systems move around between the other body and here, you got it. I mean, I just thought of that. I was looking at that, and I I just thought here's a here's an example of something that could be by itself. So Senator McQuaid, Mr. Chair, I mean, I and um, Senator Abel, I think that. It's not information no one else has, but our finance chair has indicated his preference to hearing things as we have them and not keeping everything for an omnibus bill. Um, and I think that when I'm thinking the difference between what might go in an omnibus bill and what might not, $2 million is probably doesn't need to be, it's not going to like offset a huge target. 50 million might, a billion might, 1.825 billion might. Um, and so I think that would be, that might Pretty be good. my, my, um, my balancing test there as, as is this very important for an omnibus target or is it not two million eh. it, it, thank you for that senator abler well i just um i don't know uh, <laughs> mr nauman's not here but i uh, represent the finance world is i have a feeling that someone's going to keep a list and i think two million might actually make the list i don't know i, I think they're you know it's there's just so much money and I think at the end you could just throw a little tax increase on the rich just to fill in the gap. And I think I knew he was going to come back to that, right? That, that, that's <laughs> that's twenty years of knowing this guy, Senator McQuaid. I knew that was coming in, um, Senator Matthews. You remember when I walked in your room four years ago and, and I made that comment, and you looked at me and you said, "What about me?" <laughs> it's like I'll never forget that. I I just am trying to. I mean, these are so. I mean, this is why I lo this committee. These are real life. I sweat. I worry issues that just sit here and, and your lived experience and it's just you know how can you not but say what can we do to help offset that to make it right like you said for the next person that's coming in senator Abel. mr chair my last thought and just to encourage you i believe that members of your caucus are going to be very interested in the needs that have been presented today and if not there's a goodly amount of people on here inside yeah. that caucus who are here and people outside who care i was able it took me from October until February to encourage my caucus to spend a billion dollars. And they did. And we stuck with that the whole way through with the most sincere intent. And we would not have had half the testimony that we had today. Right. Been, but, but so that's my advice. You do what you want. <laughs> Se thank you. Senator Matthews. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. I just thought I'd share, um, you know, this, this bill is meeting a really big need. Uh, our family went through it uh, last year. I've Both my grandfathers struggled with dementia or Alzheimer's at the end of their lives. And uh, one passed six, seven years ago and um, lost my second one last year. And he needed, uh, he needed care, he needed outside assistance at the end of his life. Uh, and there was none to be found for my area. And thankfully, that period uh, only lasted about three or four days, uh, but it all landed on our family, who we had built a system for years leading up to it where uh, our family was going to do everything we could to help our grandparents uh, in their final stage of life. But we got to that point at the end where my mom told me we're literally calling around mm -hmm. and there is no place available to help. And uh, so this is stepping up and meeting a need that uh, we need, uh, not only in rural Minnesota, 
but around. Um, we you know, we visited him uh, the Sunday before our family came in uh, for a week of session, uh, and it was the last good day he had that Sunday and uh, past midweek. So very real uh, impacts uh, families in a, in a very real and meaningful way. Um, to our testifier here, and I'm, I apologize, forgot your name, but all those flashbacks were coming back to mind as you were sharing your story uh, because we know what that's like. And so glad that we uh, see a bill like this moving forward and happy to support it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. It, it, so um, thank you for sharing your lived experience on that. I'm um, wondering in your thought process of that and and I as you were talking I looked at Senator May Quaid and now I'm I'm leaning more to re-refer pass as amended and re-refer that to finance and send it on its way because of the fact that it's needed is are you you shaking you're you're good Senator Mitchell anybody uh Senator May Quaid, that seems to be consensus up here you know what do you want to do uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would uh, make the motion to recommend this bill pass and be referred to the Committee on Finance. And at your discretion, Mr. Chair, you could always have it sent back if you'd like to include it in an omnibus. That is correct. We can do that. So Senator May Quaid makes the motion to um, pass as amended. Oh, Mr. Chair. Thank Go you. ahead. I do have one oral amendment. Uh-oh. It doesn't change the bill. Is this going to change everything now? Is this... <laughs> It is an oral amendment. She's going to add more money. Is it? <laughs> all right. So, do you want to you want to brief us before we make a go ahead, yes. Senator Makeway? Uh, Mr. Chair, it's on line two point eight. Um, it inserts the word "adult" before "companion." That's all. Um, uh, the original bill language, excuse me, before it was amended. So, 2.8, you're going to put insert the word adult where? Before companion services. Adult companion services. That, Mr. Monahan is shaking his head. So, we have an oral amendment, line 2.8. Everybody's shaking their head to add the word adult companion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Uh, there we go. Now, Mr. Chair, now, Mr. Chair, I move uh, Senate File 1020 as amended and amended, uh, recommend it to be passed and put to the Committee on Finance, refer to the Committee on Finance. Members, you hear that? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, testifiers. It is on its way. So uh, with that, any other comments? We got uh, nothing? Folks, I think we're good. Thank you, everybody, for staking in there. Thank you for bringing those bills. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And with that, we are adjourned.